Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're in John's Gospel, chapter 5. John, chapter 5. And as we continue our way through the Gospel of John, we're going to be picking up uh, in verse 16. John 5 at verse 16. Um, and to give the backstory, it's been a couple of weeks. Uh, you recall that Jesus made his way from Galilee down to Jerusalem to celebrate an unnamed feast. Uh, and he went in through the sheep gate. He came there to the pool of Bethesda. And there was a group of people with various ailments. And Jesus went up to one who is perhaps the most critical of all of them. And he asked him a very interesting question. He said, do you want to be made well? And the man looked, could only look at the natural. He could only look at what, what availed him. And he, he saw the impossibility of it. And then Jesus healed him. And we're told that it was done on the Sabbath day. And this being done on the Sabbath day, this created a ruckus. And the reason for the ruckus, the reason for this is that Jesus wanted to get into the focal point of the conversation of the religious leaders because he wanted to teach them something. And so all of that, that miracle, that work that he did in that individual's life was to open the door for what he would say in the remainder of John chapter 5. And so we'll walk through that together. I want to remind you, um, I think we're all familiar with it, but I want to remind you of that, that Christmas hymn, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, uh, one of Charles Wesley's greats. And in one of the lines of that song, it, it goes like this, Veiled in flesh, the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity. What a great line. Veiled in flesh, the Godhead see, Hail the incarnate deity. And, and what, what Charles Wesley's pointing out in that line is that Christ came veiled in human flesh. That Jesus Christ, the Son of God, wrapped himself in humanity. He was veiled by his humanity. Paul put it this way. It's uh, on the screen, Philippians chapter 2. Paul put it like this. He said, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. He's going to describe Christ. The next verse says this, who, that's Jesus, being in the form of God. That word form there in the Greek language is a word that would speak of it in his very essence. So if you were to slice him open, he's God. He said, who being in the form of God did not consider robbery uh, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. In other words, claiming equality with God takes nothing from the Father. And then he says this, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of man. That's what, that's what Charles Wesley's talking about when he says that, that the Christ veiled himself in humanity. That, 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 that incarnation wrapping himself in a human form, that God made himself of no reputation and took on a human body. Paul put it this way when he wrote to the young Timothy about the ministry. He said, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. So he said, hey man, there's this amazing mystery. Now Paul's a thinker, right? That's what Paul did. Paul thought and he wrote about it. He was a great thinker, one of the great minds of human history. And he said, there is a mystery so great that it can't really even be grappled with the human mind. And he went on to say this. He said, God was manifested in the flesh. God took on human form. In uh, John chapter 1, we're told this way, one of the terms that is used to define Jesus Christ. He's called the Word of God. And we're told that the word became flesh and dwelt among us so that we could behold the glory of God, that, that, that he was full of grace and full of truth. And so the reason for this, this Jesus veiling himself, the reason for Jesus wrapping himself into humanity is because it's not possible for us to see God apart from Christ. Jesus became a man so that we could see God. And John 1 at verse 18 puts it like this. It's on the screen. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who's in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. So here's the idea. Jesus wraps Himself in humanity. 
And then John, as John takes us through these three and a half years of the ministry of Jesus Christ, John begins to unwrap him. And he begins to let the glory come out. And he begins to let us see the real Jesus, that, that he who is clothed in the, you know, in the skin of a carpenter, John would just begin to unveil that as he writes this gospel. Keep in mind the purpose in which John wrote this letter. The reason why this book was written, we'll put it up on the screen again, you should be getting used to this verse. It should be one that's, that's kind of sticking with you. John chapter 20, verse 30 says this, Truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book. Okay? Uh, later he'll say, All the books of the world can't hold everything Jesus did. And then he says this, he says, But these ones, the ones that I recorded, John chapter 5, starting at verse 16, where we're at tonight, these ones were written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life in his name. In other words, John, John's goal is to present to us the real Jesus, that we would see who Jesus Christ really is, that perhaps, perhaps whatever our thinking might be of Jesus would be altered by reading through John's gospel. Isn't it interesting how many people who are, who are relatively ignorant as to what the Bible says speak as though they're an authority on Jesus Christ? And we all kind of do that. You know, we all kind of, and, and perhaps, you know, before you came to the Lord or, you know, somebody talked to you about Jesus and you said, oh, I know about Jesus. I know about Jesus. Because what, you watched the cartoon when you were a kid or, you know, maybe, you, you know, you watched the, 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 the TV movie you know, so it makes you an authority on Jesus. John is telling us that his purpose in writing is to reveal the real Jesus. And here's why. Because faith in Christ will change your life, it'll change your death, and it'll change your eternity. That's what he says. He says, man, I'm writing to you about the real Jesus because the real Jesus, when you put your trust in him, he'll change your life. He'll change your death, and he'll change your eternity. Now, John calls him in our text, bring that verse 30 up, 31 up one more time. I think thir verse 31, he says this, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, and what's the next line? The Son of God. Now, where does John get this idea? Like, John's writing this at the conclusion of his book, and he says, I'm writing because I want you to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Now, where do you get the idea? Where do you get the idea that Jesus is the Son of God. Well, let's take a look at our text. Before we read all the way through it, let's take a look at verse 25, John chapter 5, verse 25. We read, most assuredly. Okay? In, in Greek, that's the same word uh, repeated. Okay? It's translated in English, English most assuredly. In, he, in Greek, it's this, amen, amen. Okay? Amen, amen. G amen is used at the conclusion, right? When we're talking to the Lord, it's like, it's like see you later, bye, or okay, love ya, or, or okay, talk to you later, or you know, until next time, or whatever. You know, that's the way we hang up our conversations with the Lord, right? We're talking to the Lord, and we, we finish up, and we say amen, correct? Jesus, in, in, in a number of occasions in John's gospel, in fact, you know, twice in our text, Jesus put it at the front of the statement to draw our attention to it. He said it twice, amen, amen. The, the term is a word that means, you know, truly, okay? It means it's a truth. So really when you're saying amen at the end of a prayer, you're agreeing with God. You're agreeing, God, your word said that you wanted to do these kind of things, and so I'm asking you to do this thing, and I'm in agreement with your word. That's what amen means, okay? And so Jesus put it at the front, and he draws our attention. He says, this is the truth, okay? Here's his truth, verse 25. Amen, amen, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the who? Son of, Son of God. The dead, right now, Jesus says, the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will what? Live. Dead people living? This is creepy. This is really creepy. What's he talking about? Okay, he's talking about dead people. This is the zombie apocalypse. Okay. 
What, what Jesus says right now, today, at this moment when he's speaking, dead people are going to hear his voice and they are going to live. They're going to hear the voice of the Son of God. Now we'll talk about the dead hearing in a moment. Let's talk first about the Son of God. Now, in our vernacular, the term Son of God would mean what? What would it mean? Give me, another, give me another term that would be equivalent in our vernacular with the son of. Child. Offspring, right? That's, how we, that's what we speak, like speak of it. You know, the, the, what's that one movie? The Finding Nemo. <laughs> Remember that? Okay. The turtles, they're like full surfer turtles. They're like offspring, jelly man, jelly man, offspring. Okay. <laughs> It means it's the child, okay? It's the, you know, the product of. You know, today, Christy and I got back. We got off the airplane this morning, nine something, um, and made our way here. And when we, when we, uh, you know, we arrived, we got cleaned up, and then we came, and, and three of our four boys were working, they work at the same place. And so we went by to see them, and we walk in, and, you know, they come out, and then Julianne and her family happen to show up, and then Nathan and his wife, showed up and it's like we had this full family reunion, you know, hanging out there, me with all my offspring. Okay, jelly man, offspring, offspring, jelly man. So, um, but you know that in our, in our vernacular, son of means the offspring of. And so often we read this term, you know, the son of God, and we, then we get confused, like, wait, wait, I thought he was God. If he's God manifests the flesh, how's he the son? Where's this work? Like, where'd he come from? And we get really confused because we're thinking, we're thinking our vernacular. We're not thinking their vernacular. You see, in, in the, the Jewish culture that Jesus was speaking to, this phrase, son of, would, would, be, would be equivalent with just Jesus just saying, I'm God, okay? There's a character in the Bible, he's one of my favorite guys. His, his name is Barnabas. How many of you have heard of Barnabas, okay? Barnabas is Paul's buddy in the book of Acts. And, and Barnabas, that's not his name. Who knows what his real name was? Come on, this is, this is like trivia 2.0 right now, okay? His real name was Joe, okay, or Joseph, okay? We'll just call him Joe, it's easier, okay? So his name was Joe. So he goes to the church and they change his name. You ever have people that do that to you? Okay, like you have a given name and then they start calling you something different, okay? Like there's this one, this one you know, guy that I knew um, in the community here and I'd see him every once in a while and, and he just insisted on calling me James. I've never in my whole life ever gone by James, but to him, I was James, okay? Every time he said, well, hello, James, how you doing? And I'm like, you don't know me very well, okay? Well, or maybe he knows me really well, because you know what the word, J the name James means? Jim. Well, Jim is, the, Jim is the English, and if you go to Hallmark, if you go to Hallmark, it might say something kingly or whatever. James is the equal to the Hebrew Jacob or Jacob. It means swindler, okay? So maybe he knew me better than I thought he did, but... But you know, there's people that do that to you, you just kind of change your name, you know, or whatever, and they call you something different. Well, you know, here's this guy, Joe, comes to church, and they start calling him Barnabas, because Barnabas means this. Bar means son of, and it, it, it means, Barnabas means son of encouragement. They just watch this guy, and he's just always encouraging everybody. If he came in the room, he'd just look for the people that were discouraged, he'd go sit with them. I'm sure if Barnabas came in, he would never, he would, he would, he would, Always find the person that was sitting by themselves, looked lonely, looked hurting, he'd go hang out with them. You find Brian back there with his sling. He'd go, hey, you doing okay, bro? You all right? Skinboarding's a bad idea. And you know, and what and you know, he just kinda he'd, you know, he'd come and he'd come along and he'd hang out and he'd fellowship and minister. He's always building people up. That's Barnabas. And so they called him son of encouragement. Okay? It was it, they meant you are an encouragement, that just encouragement flows out of you. So much so was this understood when Jesus called himself the son of God, that he was deity, that it was God in the flesh, that it got him in a lot of trouble. I want you to notice two verses on the screen, John 19. John 19 says this, the Jews answered him, we have a law and according to a law, he ought to die because he made himself what? The son of God, okay? Now, how many of you in this room consider yourself to be a son of God? Raise your hand. You consider yourself to be a son of God. We'll flip the daughter thing up too so you feel good too. Okay, ladies, you count, okay, right? So like, are we all in trouble getting stoned or hung or you know, crucified? 
No, 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 because Jesus, when he said that, was saying something way different than when I say, I've been born into the family of God or, and adopted into the family of God. Jesus was claiming equality with God. Let's look at another verse, uh, Luke chapter 22. We start at verse 69. It's on the screen. Hereafter, the Son of Man, you might want to note that phrase. We're going to see it again. Hereafter, the Son of Man will sit on the right hand of the power of God. Next verse says... Then they all said, are you then the son of God? And he said to them, you rightly say that I am. Next verse says, and they said, what further testimony do we need? For we have heard it ourselves from his own mouth. And they went on to condemn him to death. Not trivia, but fact. The reason that Jesus was put to death the accusation brought against him, the crime that he committed that caused the religious leaders to condemn him to death and, con and convince the Roman authorities to put him to death was the crime of blasphemy. They said, you being a man, make yourself out to be God because he claimed to be the son of God. So when John's saying, listen, here's what I want. I want you to put your faith in the Son of God. It's because Jesus said that those who are dead in sin and hear the voice of the Son of God and put their trust in him, he said they'll be saved. That's what verse 25 says. Let's read it one more time. Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is. What hour is it? It's the now is hour, right? And now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. Those who put trust in Christ will be born again. <laughs> now, there's another title that's used in our text. Jesus uses it. Not only does he call himself the Son of God, but look at verse 27. We read there, we'll, we'll start at verse 26. For as the Father has life in himself, he has granted the Son to have life in himself and has given him authority to execute judgment because he is who? The Son of Man. Okay? Here we got the Jesus in, in, within two verses, in, in two sentences. Jesus calls himself the Son of God. And Jesus also calls himself the Son of Man. Now, the Son of Man is a title used of Jesus more than 80 times in the New Testament. It's a title that has Old Testament connection. It's a title that's used of Jesus in Daniel chapter 7 when Jesus comes to bring judgment upon the wicked. This phrase, the Son of Man, speaks of, to, on one, one hand, it speaks of his humanity. Jesus is all man. Jesus wrapped himself in human flesh, clothed himself in humanity, became one of us. God looking down at the human condition, seeing that man is hopeless apart from him, seeing that man is incapable of saving himself, man is incapable of finding life in himself. And so Jesus Christ wrapped himself in human flesh and became one of us. He came to this planet as a human being he lived as we lived. He experienced what we experienced. Not because he couldn't relate to us without it. I mean, sometimes I think we think like that. We think, well, you know, I don't know if Jesus can really relate to me because, you know, he didn't go through this exact trial that I went through. He went through different trials. So I don't know if he can relate to my trial as though Jesus can only relate to us because he wrapped himself in flesh. He's God. He can relate to us. He can understand everything that you're going through. But on top of that, he wrapped himself in flesh so that you would be able to look at his condition and you'd be able to hear him say, hey, you know, the, the foxes, they have holes to sleep in. And the birds, they have nests. Nests are made out of trash, okay? They have trash to sleep in. And we, and he says, and the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. So like our condition, we go, oh man, I don't know, man, my life's falling apart. I, I, I'm losing everything. I don't have anything. And we look and we go, oh, Jesus didn't even have a hole to sleep in. Jesus had nothing. I, he can relate to my condition. He can understand what I'm going through. Remember when he was, in, when he was being tempted by the devil and the, and the devil came to him 40 days, he'd been fasting. And what was the first temptation? 
turn rocks into stone, right? No, they're already stone. What should we turn them into? That was jet, hashtag jet lag moment. Okay, what are we going to turn them into? Bread, right? So, and, and, you know, did Jesus on other occasions, I mean, Jesus turned nothing into bread on, another, on two other occasions, right? He had five loaves and two fish, and he fed the multitude, thousands of people, right? And so in that case, Jesus turned nothing into bread. It wasn't just like, it's like, okay, well, here we'll do is stretch it out, you know? Like we were, I remember camping with this buddy of mine. It's now my, my son and daughter-in-law's brother-in-law. But we were camping with their family, and, uh, and he was making eggs, and he's counting out the eggs, and he's counting out the people, and he goes, just add a lot of water. <laughs> it's like, water makes them fluffy. No, it just makes them more. You know, so he's adding a bunch of water to kind of spread out the eggs because he's counting the number of people and not sure that he can feed them all. Jesus took, he didn't just take the bread and kind of like, oh, let's make it super airy and just, you know, it's super fluffy angel food bread and, and so that everybody gets a taste. He multiplied, he took nothing and from nothing he made more, right? And so Jesus could do that, but he did that to meet the needs of others when he was being tempted he didn't turn the stone to bread because he wouldn't use his miraculous power to meet his own physical needs. Why? Because if he did, every time you had a difficulty, you'd look back and go, well, that's just because he's God. Well, he's sure he could do that. I could sleep without a bed too if I were God because when no one's looking, I'm making a palace. Okay? But he didn't do that. He's, he's, he humbled himself. He took on human flesh. He's the son of man. But the son of man also speaks of his deity. It's not just a human phrase. It's used to speak of the fact that he, God, became man. And so our text, what we're looking at in our time together tonight, we're looking at John as he kind of starts to take the veil off of Jesus. He's, t- he's taking his mask off and we're being able to see the glory of the Son of God. We're seeing this, John take the, the carpenter turned rabbi and we're seeing him as John reveals him to be the Son of God. Now how does it happen? Jesus used the backdrop of healing that man on the Sabbath day. We remember the story. The guy is incapable of movement and He wants to get in the water when the angel stirs it, but there's no way it's gonna happen. He doesn't even have a friend. He's in such a bad condition that he doesn't even have somebody to help him. And Jesus comes and Jesus heals him. And Jesus purposely did it on the Sabbath day in order to catapult himself into the conversations of the religious leaders. Look with me at chapter five, verse 10. The Jews therefore said to him who was cured, it's the Sabbath, it's not lawful for you to carry your bed. Look at verse 15. The man departed and told the Jews it was Jesus that made him well. For this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to do what? Kill him, because he'd done these things on the Sabbath. Now once he'd grabbed their attention, because he could have done this on any day of the week, right? I mean, I don't want to be cruel, but this guy wasn't going anywhere, okay? I mean, he was crippled. He'd been there for years. Jesus could have gone any day and ministered to this guy. The fact that he did it on the Sabbath day is on purpose. He wants the attention of the religious leaders. He wants the accusations to come against him because then he would say this. Let's look at our verse, verse 17. Jesus answered them. And here's a statement. My father, because he's the son of God, my father has been working until now and I have been working. My father's been working until now and I have been working. Now, why were they so angry that Jesus healed the man? Why? Because the Sabbath day, okay? And what, what did they say should be done on the Sabbath day? You should rest, no work, right? And what was their, what was their reason, reasoning behind saying you shouldn't do any work on the Sabbath day? Because God rested, right? Right? So here, here's the deal. You got this guy walking, he's carrying his mat. Remember Jesus told him, he said to 
walk, and the, and the word I told you was peripateo, okay, which means to walk about. So he's kind of like cruising around with his mat, like she just told me just walk around with this thing, get attention. So here I am walking around with this mat. And they say, hey, what are you doing? And he says, listen, the, this guy healed me, and he told me to carry this thing around, so I did it. And they say, it's the Sabbath. You can't carry that around. On the Sabbath day, we rest. And their rationale was because God rested on the Sabbath, right? That's the whole backing. God rested on the Sabbath, so you gotta rest on the Sabbath. And what does Jesus say? What's his response? My father's been doing what? Until now, and I've been working alongside of him. <laughs> you're, you're saying God, God rested, so we can't do anything. But do you understand? that my father has been working every moment, every second since then, and I've been working alongside him, which is, a, a, again, another claim to deity. They, they understand it, verse 18. The Jews sought all the more to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath, but said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. I mean, you know, it, God's been working. I can't keep up with that. Jesus is saying I'm working alongside him. It's a reference to deity. Okay, and they understood that reference. Jesus is saying that he's working along with him, that he is equal to God. He's not only claiming to be God, but he's also revealing something about the way that God works. He's been working even until now. This verse to me is a great comfort. A great comfort. God's working. You know, there's another verse in the Psalms that says, it says, he who watches Israel, and Israel would be a refer reference to those in a covenant relationship with God. He who watches Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps, okay? He's never, God never takes a day off. It's not like he's going, okay, I got this ball rolling. You guys are gonna be fine. Okay, you be fine just for a few minutes. I remember uh, my first year as a, as a school teacher, and uh, I had a situation where I, I had to leave the room to go outside to talk to a student that was overly rambunctious. So I went outside and you know, it was one of those things where he was overly rambunctious, not just in my class, but in every class. And so he was like, if he got sent to the office one more time, it might be like he gets his walking papers, he's gonna go find a new school. So I go out there to tell him, listen buddy, like, I'm, I'm gonna have to write you up. And he just starts crying. He was bawling and please no, don't do this to me. And I, you know, I don't have a heart, but this little dark thing in me started pulsating. And and I'm like, oh, what am I going to do? I'm not, and I, you know, I'm not going to be that teacher that, sent, that writes the last one. I'm not going to be that guy. So when you know when he's 35 years old and on parole and he, and you know he's he's talking to people and he's saying Jim Gallagher, it's his fault. You know, I'm not going to be that guy. So so as a result. I'm trying to figure out, okay, how can I help this kid, you know, get through this thing? So it took a little longer than the normal just step outside, whatever. So I just stepped out and left the class unattended for just a few moments. I open the door and go back inside. This is a true story. There are kids on the tables. They're standing on the tables. There's stuff flying across the room. It's just chaos. There's a couple of, of sweet girls just like huddle, like covering up like, oh no, we're all dead, you know? And it's just <laughs> chaos. I open the door like, Oh my, and people are diving off the tables, running for their, their, their seats. And I thought, I was outside for three minutes. Imagine what would happen if God did slumber. Like you think, this, you think the world's a mess right now, okay? God doesn't sleep. He's saying, listen, I'm at work in the world. My father's at work in the world. We're involved in what's happening in the world. Just, just because God completed the work of creation, and that's really what it means when it says, that on, on the seventh day God rested, it means that the work of creation has been completed. In fact, there's the, 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 the law of the conservation of mass, which essentially states that, that, that mass, what is created, doesn't, doesn't go away. It just changes forms. And so you, it, it's, you know, that within our universe, mass doesn't add and mass isn't subtracted. It just changes form. Everything that's been created is here since the day of creation. It just changes form. Okay, the chairs that you're set were, are sitting in, they were in some other form. And someday, should the Lord tarry, they're going to be in another form. We're going to walk in one day and go, all right, it's time for new chairs. Okay, and these things are going to go off to chair heaven. <laughs> the, the, the basic idea is that he's saying, listen, just because 
God hasn't worked in creation doesn't mean that God isn't at work in our lives. You know the same thing is true of salvation? Remember Jesus is on the cross? He's hanging on the cross and just before he breathes his final breath, he says this, it's on the screen, John 19. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, what? It's finished. What's he talking about? What's finished? Salvation, everything's been accomplished. There's, because of that statement, because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross, there is no reason for any individual to end up in hell ever. It's finished. The work's been done. God's paved the road. It's a wide open road for any individual. It doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter what your experiences are. It doesn't matter how many times you've failed. It doesn't matter what you've got caught up into. Every single person can go to heaven because Jesus made a way. He says, it's finished. But let me ask you this. Was Jesus finished? When Jesus, when Jesus made that final, is that it? He's like, okay, I'm, I'm tapping out. I'm done. God created it. I saved it. Now I'm done. I'm out. No, Jesus is involved. God's still at work in the world today. Jesus told us this. Two ways in which he's at work in the world today. One, he said this. He said that that it's, it's beneficial, two times, he said it was beneficial for him to go to the Father, to leave the earth. And the disciples, I'm sure, are going, I don't think so. But he said it's beneficial, here's why, because when I leave, I'm gonna send you the helper, the Holy Spirit. And here's what the Holy Spirit's gonna do. He's gonna convince the world that they're sinners, that he's righteous, and that there's a coming judgment. The Holy Spirit's at work in the world today. And when we're praying, when we're praying, God, do a work in our community, do a work in my family, do a work in my workplace, do a work, Lord, in the, in the social circles that I hang out with, we're praying, God, send your spirit to convince the people of their need for Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit's at work in people's lives. And then Jesus said this, and this is crazy. Jesus said, it is to your advantage that I go away. And he said, because you will do greater works than I've done. That to me is the most mind-boggling verse in all of scripture. Jesus is saying, listen, you're better off without me. And I'm, I'm, like, I'm like Mary holding onto his garment. Don't go, <laughs> don't go, please stick around. I know, like there's no situation that I've ever been in that I would say would not be better with Jesus next to me. Not one. Like any situation I've ever been in life, it'd be like, yep, better if he's here. <laughs> Doesn't matter, math test, right? Math test, hey Jesus, number six, okay? Better off, okay? <laughs> There's not a given situation. And yet he said, you're better off when I leave because I'm gonna send you the Holy Spirit. And because of the work of the Holy Spirit, you're gonna do greater works than I've done. Now, he wasn't saying greater kind of in essence because the works that he did sort of cover the whole gamut of amazing things. He's saying greater in scope because Jesus, you know, Jesus only did ministry in a tiny little dot on the planet. Little, small area, not as large as Florida, over in the Middle East, it's a little area in the world. But then because of people being born of the Spirit, and filled with the Spirit, and called to the Spirit, and sent by the Spirit. The work of God is now global. There's people all over the world hearing the same message, being born of the same Spirit, and having their life transformed by Jesus Christ, greater in scope. And so Jesus said, listen, my Father has been working till now, and I have been working alongside of him. I have one more thing I want you to see, and then we'll tie this up, and that is, <clears throat> Jesus speaks of the continued work that he wants to do. Look at chapter five, verse 21. For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. We saw verse 25, we'll look at it again. I promised we'd talk about it. Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. Jesus speaks of dead people living. So Jesus is saying, listen, my, just as my father continued to work once the Sabbath, just, just as he kept involved in what's going on in the earth, 
So I am still involved with what's going on. And his involvement is, is that he will give life to the dead. Dead people will hear him speak and they will come to life. Now the Bible speaks of death in three ways. Number one, it speaks of physical death. And physical death is the lot of all men. Save, save that generation that is raptured, every one of us will face death. Death is the common lot of all men. The Bible speaks of a second death. The Bible speaks of spiritual death. And spiritual death is defined biblically as separation from God. So a person that is living, they're alive, they're breathing, they're walking, they're talking, they're eating, they're, they're part of culture and society, they have opinions, they have emotions, they have, they have what we would call life, but they're, they're not in relationship with God. And the Bible defines that as being spiritually dead. And that person is not in contact with God. That person can't understand the things of God. That person is not, not uh, living a life that glorifies God. But that can be remedied through faith in Jesus Christ. And when, when a person who is spiritually dead hears the promise that those who put their faith in the Son of God will have life, and they respond to that by saying, I want to put my faith in the Son of God, they come to life. We pass from death to life through faith in Jesus Christ. That's what happens. We come alive to God. And suddenly, we're now able to have a relationship with Him. We're suddenly now able to, to hear and speak from his word and change our life from the inside out. We're suddenly now able to offer our prayers to him and know that he listens and hears us. Now for the person who is spiritually dead and refuses to put faith in Jesus Christ, the Bible speaks of a third death. And that third death is eternal death. It's a death that can be avoided. The Bible also calls it the second death. That's a horrible phrase, isn't it? Like I know, you know, my wife, um, she's, she's not afraid of death, but she's kind of concerned about dying, okay? And she's got a list of ways that she doesn't want to go, okay? And I think the only way that she's, that she's heard about that she kind of, that, that will work, is just you close your eyes and you wake up in heaven. That one's okay with her. Okay, all the other ones she's heard about, it's like, no, not really interested in that. When, we, when I was in Hawaii, we, I went over, we have friends that live on the North Shore, and we went over to visit them, and, and a swell had hit. So um, this, this friend of mine and I, we went out surfing, and then he had to go to work. So I came back in, and he went to work, and I decided the waves are still really good. I'll go out one more time just by myself. And so I got out, and I'm there, and it's breaking out on the second reef and coming in. And it's, you know, the waves in Hawaii are not like the waves here. They're like rolling mountains. And I, I'm out there and I caught a couple waves and I just, I'm looking around and there's no one as far as I can see anywhere. And there's, you know, all these rocks on the beach and my wife, I can barely see her. And when I go over a wave, she disappeared. I'm, I'm like, this is really not a good idea. I don't think I want to go to heaven this way. Like, I don't want to go to heaven, and I don't want my wife, I don't want to go to heaven by drowning out here or getting pummeled up against a rock and my wife having to pull my leash to find my leg. You know, I, I just really don't want to do that. Like, I'm not interested in that thing, and so I went in. And, you know, the, the, the reality is, you know, we, the Bible talks about then, wait, a second death? Like, I got to worry about this one, and then I got to worry about another one? Like, Okay, but here's what the second death is. The second death is that eternal separation from God. The Bible calls it hell, the lake of fire. And that, that second death is for the person who refuses the life that's found in Christ. And so Jesus says, hey, there's a, there's a time coming, and you know what, it's right now, when dead people, those who have no relationship with God because of sin, they're gonna hear him, and they're gonna put their faith in Jesus Christ, and they're gonna come to life. And for that person, now they don't have to worry about physical death because it's just a transition. They don't have to worry about spiritual death because they've been born again, they've come alive. And they don't have to worry about the second death because he who has been born twice will only die once. Those that have been born of the Spirit will never have to face that. And so Jesus allows, he goes to this guy, he heals him to create a ruckus because he wants them to know that his father's been working. 
and that that work involves the salvation of lives. And I want to encourage you tonight. If you have not put your trust in Jesus Christ and made a public profession of faith in Jesus, we want to give you the opportunity to do that tonight. There's no better decision that you'll ever make and no better place to ever make it than, than in a room full of people that love you and are praying for you. So we're going to bow our heads right now and we're going to pray.